So welcome everybody. Welcome to our online discussion panel about China space. And today I'm very honored to have such, um, such a great uh, panel of guests. Um, I would like to start with uh, Professor Sun Gongling. Um, I'll just call you Gongling for, uh, from now. And um, so Professor Sun is a professor of space systems engineering at the International Space University. He became a founding member of the China Manned Space Agency in 1993 and worked as a general designer assistant for the China Manned Space Program for eight years. He is the founder of the European Office of the China Aerospace Science and Technology Corporation in Paris and served as a chief representative for seven years. Then we're also honored to have uh, Dr. Robert Zubrin. Um, Dr. Zubrin is the founder and president of the Mars Society. At Martin Marietta, he and his colleague David Baker were the driving force behind Mars Direct, a proposal in a 1990 research paper intended to produce significant reductions in the cost and complexity of human Mars of a human Mars mission. The key idea was to use the Martian atmosphere to produce oxygen, water and rocket propellant for the surface stay and return journey. A modified version of the plan was subsequ subsequently adopted by NASA as their design reference mission. Dr. Zubrin was an inspiration to Elon Musk to pursue Mars colonization and has appeared in numerous TV shows. He's also the founder of Pioneer Astronautics and Pioneer Energy. His latest book is The Case for Space, How the Revolution in Spaceflight Opens Up a Future of Limitless Possibility. And our third speaker is uh, Dr. Lucas Sol. Dr. Sol is originally from Vermont, um, and he is an assistant professor at the Hefei University of Technology in China. Previously, he was a postdoctoral assistant for the University of Bern in Switzerland, doing satellite instrument testing and calibration. From 2005 to 2014, he was a NASA IBEX investigator. Um, his spouse is Chinese and his daughter is native in Western and Chinese culture. And um, fun fact, I would say, uh, his grandfather was uh, Mr. Lyman Spitzer Jr. And his uh, grand auntie was uh, Miss Anna Louise Strong, um, who at that time knew the, the Chinese Prime Minister, uh, Zhou Enlai. So first of all, thank you all for joining in today. Um, it's really an honor to have such a, such a great panel. So I would like to start with uh, Professor Sun, or actually, let's just call you Gongling by your first name. Um, I would like to ask you, um, according to the Harris Poll survey, 56% of kids in China said they wanted to be an astronaut. Also, from my travels to China last year, I could see that space influence was popping up everywhere in daily life in China, from advertisements to children's education in museums or children's palaces. So do you think that China is on the brink of becoming a spacefaring society within the coming decades? Uh, uh, thank you, thank you, uh, uh, Kaki, and thanks for your introduction for for me. And uh, so, in China, that uh, for the space activities, and it's we have a long history. And for the um, and very beginning, it's just a dream. And uh, some hundred years before, there is also a Chinese guy. His name is Wang Hu. He tried with the stripper on booster forty-seven and for his flight. 
is is he of course the, the test was lost and he also lost his life. But from here you can see in China we have a really a long history for the human space flight and also for the space exploration. And uh, also this is really the case and in China we have uh, uh, the space activities, activities have a very strong and influence and for the daily life and especially and for the for the and, uh, and for the kids and uh, I think there are several reasons. One is uh, the the first one is uh, in China the, we have a lot of outreach activities and for, if we take an example of the human space flight and we also had a lecture which is given by uh, our female astronaut. Um, Madame Wang Yaping in orbit, I think it's uh, 2013. This is a very nice lecture and all the Chinese uh, students in the primary school, in the middle school, and uh, in China, we are big countries. So we have a total of uh, 60 million students followed her lectures and which is delivered in orbit. So from here, you can see they have a lot of uh, activities in China. And the, I think the most important reason is that uh, it's uh, that the kids' interest in the space activities, especially for their dreaming and to become an astronaut in the future, is also that we have uh, long-term and continuous success and uh, in the space activities. Yeah, for example, for the human space flight, for the lunar exploration region, and also for the last month, we also launched our Mars mission. And uh, so this is could be and also very important reason and for the kids' interest and uh, in the space activities and uh, and we are talking about the space faring country and of course we are thinking we are space faring country already and so in china we build a lot of activities in the different area for the launch and satellite and also for the human space flight and uh, deep space exploration maybe we give the floor to uh, our other panelists and then I could make some more detailed introduction about activities itself in China. Thank mm -hmm. you. But basically you think, uh, yes, there is a general and a lasting interest within the, the youth in China for space, right? Yes, yes, right. And this is uh, which I mentioned already. This is uh, the, the mm, boomed by the different uh, by historical reason and the outreach for the country. For the for the, the the Chinese space community and also the the success of the different missions and it is said that nothing could be could be sexier than success. So this is the most important reason. Yes, great, thank you. Um, the next question is for Dr. Zubrin or uh, Robert. Um, you have traveled to China last year and you have seen many space startups in China and other related institutions as well. Um, so, so what is your general impression? What did you think? Well, uh, the general impression certainly is that uh, um, um, space exploration is of great interest in China and uh, it is inspiring a whole generation of uh, engineers and scientists. Uh, to want to be engineers and scientists so, so that they can uh, take part in this. I think this is having um, for China an extremely positive impact, uh, um, you know, uh, just as it did in the United States when we had a very bold space program in the 1960s during the Apollo period. Uh, it caused our, our numbers of, of, of science graduates to double and, and triple in, in every level at high school, college, uh, doctorate. Um, and uh, we have benefited from that intellectual capital ever since. I, I was one of that uh, generation. Um, I happen to be uh, unusual within it in that I actually ended up doing uh, space uh, technology. Uh, uh, innumerable others went into other fields uh, where they've had very large impact. Uh, most notably uh, of the computer revolution. Um, so um, as a strategy of promoting the development of intellectual capital, um, the United States has benefited from this. Uh, China has benefited from this. 
uh, I think uh, Europe has harmed itself by uh, not having uh, a space program commensurate with its potential. Um, you know, Europe has a population and an economy larger than the United States, and its space program is one fifth the size. Um, so um, now, of course, U.S. has benefited from that because a lot of very bright Europeans have emigrated to the United States so they could uh, take part in our space program. Um, so I, I think um, that this example um, which has been shown in the United States, China is benefiting from it greatly right now, and Europe would be quite wise to take note and uh, in, in, embark upon a much bolder space program itself. And and the space startups in China, um, do you think they were um, just as good as SpaceX, or probably they they are not as well funded as SpaceX, for example, right? Well, they're not as far along as SpaceX. SpaceX is uh, unique. Uh, the um, but uh, there's no doubt that. Um, it has inspired uh, a number of groups in China to think, well, if he can do it, we can do it. And, uh, you know, the group I visited with was developing a two-stage, uh, partially reusable launch vehicle comparable to the Falcon 9. Um, Elon Musk, of course, is aware that he is going to face competition from Chinese ventures. And so that's why he is not uh, content with settling with his current accomplishments of the Falcon line. He, he is uh, uh, moving to develop a, a new generation, the Starship, so that by the time the Chinese do have uh, vehicles comparable to the Falcon 9 and the Falcon Heavy, he'll have something better. And then they'll keep coming. Um, and we're going to have very healthy competition. It's going to cause um, a drastic drop in the cost of Space Launch International. I think Excellent. it's a very healthy dynamic. Okay, wonderful. Yeah. Um, so now to uh, Dr. Saul or Lucas. Um, what do you think are the main reasons for people in the Western world to venture to space? And what are the main reasons for people in China to venture to space? Do you think they're kind of similar or do you think they like to go to space for different reasons? Uh, I certainly think they're similar. Uh, we, we share occupancy here on our single spaceship of Earth, as uh, Buckminster Fuller put it. And um, we have the same same motivation. There are differences in details in uh for example, the navigational satellites, some of the local politics, um, where you're going to have your things launched. Uh, but the, the main motivations are um, universal. Um, there's uh, communications, earth imaging, weather and navigation. I, I listen to XM radio on my way to the office here today. A lot of, a lot of immediate motivations. We also have... Uh, Dr. Zubrin put it very well. Some of the incredible benefits we get are not just from the, the satellites, but from the, the subsidy to science, technology, academics that really can boost the society and the morale. Um, of course, we wish to learn about the universe we live in and uh, you, you can't replace, you, you have to venture out to, to the, the advances from the space telescopes are astounding and uh, Voyager going out to the edge of the heliosphere. And now we have solar probe mission. Uh, and these are all, I could go on and on with this question. Thank you for this question, Carly. Okay. <laughs> um, right. But uh, you also have to mention that uh, when you study some of, of um, learn something about space, you, you realize how fragile our, our spaceship is. It's a little... This thin, thin atmosphere, and it has to be just in this near this triple point of water. And uh, there's a lot of things that that will happen to Earth, and that we are not prepared for. Uh, and if we wish to help Gaia, uh, our the living body of Earth, to survive, we need to to venture forth. And it, it's basically a binary proposition: either we can move on to the next level or we die here. And, and so that's that's a, 
also a, to, in my heart, that's an important motivation. Um, so basically you mean that um, like Mars colonization could be also like a matter of uh, risk management, right? I mean, yes. So. I mean, yeah, it's, um, we, we would benefit by having a, a second home, a second uh, to don't put all your eggs in one basket is a common phrase. And that's what we have, uh, all our eggs here. And of course, we need to understand a lot more. There's a long journey to, you know, before we can journey to the stars is not even barely conceivable. And, and even though um, we have a hard time building a self-sustaining base on Antarctica, um, and, and so that's something that we might need to do first before we can really move to Mars, although we can make small steps. But this is perhaps beyond your question. Okay. Um, there's, there's a lot of motivation to, to go out. We were born in space. <laughs> yeah. We live in the sun. And of course, the, you're, what you mean is to leave the gravity well of Earth. I, I understand. Yeah. Okay, thanks a lot, Lucas. <laughs> So the next question goes to uh, Gong, Gong Ling. Um, can you give us a short overview of the current and future space missions of the Chinese Space Agency, um, especially those um, concerning Mars? And uh, what's in China? Do, you know, after uh, 60 years development, and we in China, we built a, a rather comprehensive capability and in the, for the um, in the space activities and covering almost uh, all the area, for example, like the launchers. And now we the heaviest launch in China is uh, in Long March Five, and uh, the last flight is uh, for the Mars mission. And uh, so the capacity is lower, so a bit of twenty five tons. It's a uh, it's, uh, it's uh, similar like Ariane Five in Europe and. For the human space flight, it's uh, lasting for quite a few years and starting from the 1992. So it's 28 uh, years now, and uh, we finished the, the transportation system, and it means the launcher and also the spacecraft. And we did some short term stay in the orbit and like space lab, two space labs in the orbit. And uh, now we are in the last phase, and for the Chinese uh, space station in, um, uh, installation in orbit and for the all the sections uh, uh, for development is finished and now it's ready for the uh, uh, for the launch to the orbit and also the final uh, final uh, assembly. I think it will take uh, another two years and by the end of 2022, uh, the Chinese state space station will be. Uh, finish our um, installation in orbit. Telecommunication and this is more commercial uh, satellite and uh, we also have uh, our own telecommunication satellite and uh, this is uh, the and the newest one is still in the testing phase in the orbit. It's the launch that was the third Long March 5 and uh, navigation is also a highlight in China and uh, in, um, in July and this year we finished the deployment for the whole system. And so now all together, we have more than 40 satellites in orbit. And uh, but for the third generation, which is for the global coverage and the system itself, we have 36 satellites and uh, in the different orbit and for the for the navigation. And is the spatial, I want also want to mention that navigation system in China is uh, we are also have a unique function and there you also could including uh, some uh, communication um, um, function and means that you can um, especially this is very useful for the searching and the rescue and also for some emergency case is very helpful and uh, the uh, next area is, is for the earth observation and the, the, we have uh, several one subsystem in china we have different name earth observation we have high resolution and um, and navigation constellation, and this is mainly for the Earth observation. And we also have our, uh, uh, our own meteorological satellite, and we have um, seven satellites in orbit. We are the member of the World uh, Meteorology and Satellite Organization, and we provide the satellite data to all the member states free of charge. Space science, and this area we are 
And space science and exploration is a very hot topic in China for the lunar exploration, mass exploration. And also in recent years, we have several joint programs and with the European and, and partners, especially like ESA or with DRR or with the CNES in the different area for heart X-ray and also for some some uh, like to study the, the in the uh, solar system environment and it's following the double star program we have another uh, mission is in processing and hopefully it's going to be launched next year the last area this is the 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 the, uh, the ground facilities for example we also build our own uh, uh, system and for the launching activities and we have four launch center in china and also a very uh, comprehensive for the TTN system. This is so-called the telemetry and uh, uh, telecommand and also communication and system. This provide all the mission support and for the uh, space missions, especially from China. And the, the, you, you also mentioned about the, the mass exploration mission in China we have uh, and uh, we also, you know, this year, this is a special year and the launch window is there. So several countries uh, have launched their uh, mass probe and they're on the way and to the, to the Mars and from the United States and also from Middle East and from Japan and also one from China. From China side and the, the, the satellite is the name of the Tianwen, is in question to the sky. Is launched exactly one month before. This is July 23rd of 2020. And if you, you want, I want I could make a summarize for the for the mission objective is three words. One is for the orbiting, landing, and roving. And orbiting, of course, is very easy to understand. It's orbiting the, the Mars and make a, the, the the map and the high resolution map of for Mars. And the second one is for the landing. We are going to make a soft landing on the planet Mars. And then afterwards, we are going to perform the roving exploration. And this is the on-site exploration. And, and also maybe for the future and for the future Mars space and some even the, the human and, 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 and immigration to the Mars. And, so for the mission itself, and now it's uh, everything went smoothly, and the probe is on the way to the Mars. I think and now it's uh, roughly 19 uh, uh, million kilometers from the Earth, and it's it will be landing on the Mars according to the schedule in uh, the next uh, February, and, and it's arriving the Mars, and uh, we are going to make some some. And uh, first uh, is the orbiting, and it lasts for some months, uh, some months, and uh, it, uh, then it's after three or four months we are going to do the deorbiting, and uh, to, for the landing to the Mars, and uh, for the schedule, it's uh, in the next May or in June, and then after the landing, and we are going to do some scientific exploration on the Mars, mm -hmm. and this is the. Uh, the current uh, mission and also in the future, and we are thinking also for the mass sample return. And this is according to the plan, and the national plan is uh, around 2028. So the next uh, uh, launch window is coming. And uh, also, hopefully, we could uh, finish our development for the heavy launcher. And this is a long March 9, and the capacity for the lowest orbit could reach 140 tons. and then it's strong enough and to for the uh, mass sample return mission and this is the, also for the uh, middle term planning yeah so yeah, the situation thank you very much um w when i was in in china in beijing last year at the beginning of last year um i i went to the um, the science and technology museum in beijing and um, they also have like an, an area with space um, items and so on and um, it was interesting to me because there I saw that to to the children to the visitors and so on they are already showing a simulation of how the, the Chinese Mars space would look like so um, so you, you said there is already a fixed plan right to build a Chinese Mars space so to say 
And for the for the plan, if we're thinking about the concrete plan, and this is still in the first phase, then this means the orbiting and also the landing, soft landing and the, the rover exploration. Next one is still in the feasibility study phase, and I mean for the sample return, and also for the future, the mass phase. And of course, in China, we also have some specialists working in this area, especially to simulate and for the, the the mass base or the lunar base and uh, so it is rather similar you know this is a provider a life support and environment control system for the human beings on the mars or on on, on the moon and uh, there's uh, i also met some people and in china and they also have uh, uh institute institute in shenzhen and uh, this is a very dynamic and uh, area and the people is doing the, the simulation for um, for the uh, mass space and uh, for for example to plant um, some 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 vegetables there or the food there and also for the, to simulate the, the, the our living in the closed um, base. I think actually you told me that the, the Chinese um, astronauts or taikonauts, they, they actually always want to eat hot food, right? So there is no cold food for Chinese astronauts. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. So, so for the cold food, of course, for the drinking. And uh, we Chinese and, uh, have the habit to, to eat or drink something in war, you know. And yeah. so this is rather okay. And with a certain energy, you always could make it warm. and. Uh, mm -hmm to heat it or warm it and to make it. We love more tea and compared with cola. <laughs> of course, for tea, you have to drink it warm. And <laughs> this is normal, yeah. Uh, uh, Gongling, maybe just very briefly, um, is it easy for other nations to cooperate with the Chinese Space Agency? And for the cooperation, international cooperation, we are rather, we are rather open. and. Uh, I should say we are very open and for the uh, international cooperation. And in the last 20 years, I'm working in this area for international cooperation. And uh, for, but for the we, if we are looking about the tendency for the cooperation itself, it always goes up and down. This is also the situation we have to face. And uh, so very beginning, I started my first uh, uh, job for the international cooperation uh, was the United States. At that time, in the the end of, of, of 1980, we have a very good relation with the United States. And now, you know, we are in the down slope and the, the situation is a lot so nice. And uh, But the difficulty is a lot from China side. And it's because it's because in the United States, there's uh, some resolution from the Congress. And then they also forbid the, 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 the NASA to do any kind of cooperation with China. This is uh, the political uh, issues. And I still remember some days before and uh, in International Space U University, we had a, a, a program we called the Interactive Space uh, Program. And uh, also the GM, uh, the NASA administrator, made a speech there. And he also mentioned these issues and say, and you know, the space community love to work in together and to have a cooperation together. But sometimes we have to face in the reality especially the political obstacles. And if you, you're looking back to the Chinese uh, space cooperation, and for, I mean, the international cooperation in the space area, and we have a very good uh, uh, frame at this moment, and China is uh, open our space station and for international cooperation and uh, worldwide. And so, and uh, last year, and uh, together with the, um, the, the um, uh, United Nations, uh, I mean, the UN USA, and we have a joint program, and we also selected uh, um, more than 10 payloads from the different country, and they are going to fly with the Chinese space station. And we are also have a very good uh, discussion with uh, our European partners and also with uh, Russia. And uh, in the future, maybe you also could see the astronauts from Europe or from any other country, and uh, they have the willingness to fly to, uh, with, uh, with uh, the Chinese space station. And, and if I looking back to the my working experience for the human space flight, I still remember that I very beginning I was uh, one of my resp responsibilities for the for the interface control, interface control, you know. And so 
our Chinese space uh, craft, uh, we also have the, the interface and with the International Space Station. So if you want, and the political allows, we also could immediately fly our spacecraft uh, to the space station. This is the exact situation. So uh, just make a short summary, and uh, this is, we are open and we, it's uh, flexible for the international cooperation. We are also try our best to promote the international cooperation with our partners worldwide. Okay, thank you very much, Donglin. Um, so the next question is for Dr. Zubrin. 2019 uh, marked the 50th anniversary of the moon landing. So when I visited China back then, I mean, there were images of Buzz Aldrin in every big Chinese city. You couldn't miss it. There were, they were everywhere. Um, basically, due to the um, advertisement of the Omega watches. And um, I mean, Buzz Aldrin, since Buzz Aldrin is also um, a member of the steering committee of the Mars Society. Um, I mean, the question is, so if you in China have all these images of the US space programs and so on, what is your personal feeling of how the US space program is, is perceived? in China? Well, I, I, I think, uh, well, I think it's being watched with great interest. And I think uh, the Chinese are very enthusiastic about having their own space program. But um, the, uh, I want to address really a central point, um, which has to do with the overall relationship between the US and China, or between the West and China, um, which is the central question of the 21st century. Okay, you know, what is the major threat to humanity today? Is it climate change or resource exhaustion? Uh, no, it isn't. Uh, those, those things uh, are issues, but uh, they were not the cause of the major disasters of the 20th century. The major disasters of the 20th century were caused by something else altogether, which was bad ideas. And in particular, one bad idea in a number of different forms. Um, and that bad idea is, is that there isn't enough for everyone. And so we need to fight over what is there. And this is ultimately the cause of the two world wars and the Holocaust and the Holodomor and many other horrible things that happened. And if this idea is allowed to prevail in the 21st century, um, there will, will be war. And it will be much worse than the wars of the 20th century because our weaponry is much more powerful. And so what is, how does space remedy this? The issue is not that we're going to find oil on Mars and bring it to Earth, because we're not. <laughs> Um, the issue is that by going into space, we can defeat the idea that there's only so much to go around. See, this idea that there's only so much to go around has no empirical basis. There are um, three times as many people on Earth right now as there were when I was a boy. And people everywhere, or almost everywhere, including particularly China, uh, are living much better than they did then. There's much more to go around because resources are determined by technology and technologies are invented by people. And the more people there are and the more education they have, the more inventions there are going to be and uh, the more resources there's going to be. So this idea that there's only so much and we have to go to war to fight over what is here is, is nonsense. It has no historical basis. But people still believe it because it seems like it should be true. But what we're going to show by going into space is that it's not true, true that there's only so much to go around because the Earth comes with an infinite sky and it's wide open. And that the true human condition is not of different nations in a struggle for existence 
over limited resources. That was the Nazis' viewpoint. It was completely false, um, but it led to World War II, and a similar viewpoint led to World War I. The, 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 the true is that the different nations of the earth are a family, a rather disorderly family to be sure, but nevertheless a family of different creative beings who are making different contributions um, to expanding the human prospect. And this can nowhere be demonstrated more clearly than in space. And, you know, why fight over provinces when there are whole planets that can be opened up to human endeavors and human opportunities if we simply work together. Mm -hmm. Very well said, I would say, yeah. And um, it absolutely makes sense. Yeah, it does. Well. <laughs> um, the next question is to uh, Lucas. Um, so as an assistant professor at uh, Hefei in University of Technology in China and the previous assistant of the University of Bern in Switzerland. What do you think are the biggest cultural differences between students and scientists from China and the West? Uh, yeah, I guess I, I really uh, like what uh, Dr. Zubra said about their, our family, uh, differences in the family. Uh, I had, I'm lucky to have taught in a few countries, in Switzerland and in Hefei and here in the United States. Of course, the West is a lot of places um, and China is also very big, so you can't be very general. Um, there are some, some, some small things. If a lot of people talk about culture, they're talking about uh, food and uh, <laughs> um, there's there's not as much uh, coffee addiction in China um, there's more cigarette smoking um, in, in terms of the students in the classroom uh, I I really love I think we have a lot to learn from from Chinese society in terms of putting focus on education um, which is great and and kids have really studied a lot uh, and are are prepared to work hard often, not always. Um, the on the other hand is some of my techniques that I might use here to use a research didn't work so well in China, and a lot of the students would rather simply be be told uh, what to do rather than to be be given opportunity for choice and creativity, which is an interesting distinction. Um, there's, I, I got a chance to teach in a high school and, and in a, a computer science and also in the University of uh, Technology. So the next question is to Gongling. And I wanted to ask um, the Chinese spacecraft, they have names like Chang'e or, or Yutu or Tiangong or Shenzhou, Shenzhou. Yeah, Shenzhou, um, yeah. Shenzhou, yeah, where you were involved, yeah. Um, mm -hmm. It would be interesting to know what what do these names mean? I mean, like in the West, we have like Apollo and like other things. These are kind of mythological stories and so on. Um, is it the same in China? Yeah, it's, uh, this is similar. In China, we and you know, China, we also with a very long history, and uh, we also have uh, our, our own like the legend stories and. Uh, the by this the name for example if we take a Chang'e you know if for the writing it looks the same like the change you know but is in China we pronounce like Chang'e Chang'e in Chinese legend story she is a very beautiful lady and who is living on the moon and uh, with his servant and also Wu Gang and also his like the pet, uh, the, the, the jet rabbit, and we call the Yutu. And this is the name, Shenzhou is, uh, is uh, means the, the, the miracle or the, the vehicle or the, mm -hmm. uh, the Tiangong, this is uh, like the Swiss Palace and also by the Chinese legend. And uh, 
you know, in China, we have a very famous logo. It called the travel to the West, and it's uh, also links with the, this kind of story. And we, people, we Chinese thinking there are three different worlds. Uh, one is in the sky. We call it like Tiangong. This is uh, like the palace in heaven. And also the, the, the hill. This is normal, similar like the Western country. And we are living in this, our planet Earth. Uh, so most of the name is uh, from the legend uh, uh, story and uh, take the name of the, they also links with the, uh, because for the Lulu program, and uh, we are thinking the pretty lady Chang'e, she's uh, still living on the moon. And this is by the legend story. So we give the name for the probe in Chang'e. And because the rabbit, you know, is very active and can move around and he is, the rabbit is also, it's living on the moon and together with the, the pretty lady. And um, so, we choose the, the ruler, the name of U2. This is U2 means the jet rabbit. And uh, mm -hmm. so this is the, the names, where the names comes from. And uh, most of them from the legend story. For the, also for the mass mission, and uh, the name is also pronunciation in Chinese is Tianwen. It's a, this is also from the old, uh, old uh, poem in, I think it's 2000. 50 years before, and by the very famous uh, guy in China, his name is Qu Yuan, and his, uh, he writes something like the, lots of, this are lots of questions, and uh, which is unsolved, and he, he just uh, gives the name like the questions to the sky, and his name is Tianwen, and also in the now is also very popular activities for sports, like the, the dragon boat racing. This is memorizing this guy, and Qu Yuan, and this is the stories. Uh -huh. So actually, in the West, we would say there's the man in the moon, but actually in China or in the Chinese story, it's a woman in the moon. Woman on the moon. And the pretty lady yeah. on the moon. Yeah. Right. So, yeah. Yeah. Back to yeah. so you have the man on the moon and we have the woman on the moon. And so this is the general balance. Yes. So they could be the world family yeah. then. Yeah. But yes. Who knows? Yeah. Um, and maybe just very briefly as well, um, a question to you, Gongling. Um, so, from what I can see, the Chinese Space Agency has a very good track record. So, I cannot remember any missions that failed recently. Even the mission to the, to the far side of the moon was a success. Um, do you think like, um, like the Chinese culture um, has certain characteristics? that makes um, space missions successful? For example, um, very careful work or whatever, I don't know. And for this one, um, uh, first I have to say, you know, the space activities, we always give the name, space exploration. So no one could make the 100% uh, success. This is uh, impossible. And uh, quite often, of course, uh, after the development of the space activities in the company or in the country, and uh, the technology becomes more and more, and say, the mutual. And uh, in China, we also had uh, quite a lot of failures in the past. And if you're looking back to the history, in uh, 1990s, uh, we have several very, uh, like the failure, like disasters. And uh, so I still remember at that uh, roughly two or three years we have four losses and for the flight and afterwards we also after the study of the, the the failure and we also accumulated a different technology for this one and and we have also have our own and like the troubleshooting system and if it's the failure how should we handle with it and uh, with this kind of experience is uh, of course it's dramatically increased our reliability and uh, it's bit, and whatever for the launch itself and also for the for the spacecraft but anyhow we still even because and at the recent years we have so many activities and uh, last year we have like um, 39 flights and i don't know the exact number but we have quite a lot of uh, uh, activities and that's still i last year we have one failure and this is a lot of bigger events and so people don't pay too much attention to them and, uh, and people always keep their focus on like the human space flight mission and lunar mission all these missions are very successful there is no any failure 
low even for the delay. We even don't have delay. So this is the give people an impression that we have any no any failure. But last year we do have one failure and one another also the partial failure. And it means that part of the satellite I mean one of the satellites lose partial to function. And this is the uh, reality at this moment. And we try our best uh, to increase the reliability, but uh, space exploration is always exploration. So we have to thinking and keep uh, also our attention for the reliability to make it better. Thank you. Um, Robert, um, you, your lifelong mission is to bring humans to Mars. In what way in an optimal world should the nations of the world work together to make this happen as soon as possible. Do you think it is most effective if everybody has their own Mars missions, or do you think there should be more cooperation to in order to speed up the whole process? Well, um, I think that the best way is friendly competition. Okay an Olympic-spirited competition. That is, if we all understand that it is essential to a positive human future, that humans expand in space in general and to Mars in particular, um, that um, nations um, compete for the honor of who can do the most towards advancing humanity towards that goal. Um, so, um, I, I think that, um, yes, we should go to Mars together and the Americans should equip a ship and the Chinese should equip a ship and the Europeans should equip a ship and the Russians should equip a ship and perhaps the Japanese should equip a ship and we can all go and uh, we can help each other. We can compete to see who can make the most discoveries and be the most innovative. Uh, we can be there to help each other. Um, but I, I think that this is a more productive way to do this together than collapsing it all into one program. Um, I think, for instance, the Americans and the Soviets accomplished much more engaged in the competition of the space race than they did in collaborating on the space station. Um, you know, if we had... Olympics in which it was negotiated in advance who would win the long race and who would win the short race and who would win the high jump and uh, it would not be terribly interesting and and nor would the athletes be um, incentivized excellence um, but you know I was actually in Leningrad when we landed on the moon in 1969 because I was a young um, chess player and uh, all the Russians I knew were very enthusiastic. Uh, now, of course, they would have been even happier if the Russians had done it. But the, 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 but nevertheless, we had excelled in a sport that they could appreciate. And uh, I think that uh, approached in this way, in the spirit of friendly competition, um, we can get to, we can accomplish much more, and we can get to appreciate. Uh, the excellence and courage and, and creativity of each other um, as we share this adventure. Great, very well said, yeah, thank you. Um, good, uh, we will come back to that actually in the last question also. Um, Lucas, uh, your daughter speaks Chinese and English natively, I mean, both languages natively. She grows up and understands the culture of China as well as of the US. <clears throat> Do you think in the future, um, for the next generation, it will become it will become an important thing to understand both worlds? Uh, yes, it's it's certainly helpful to to understand and have exposure to to cultures, even not, even if they aren't the two largest languages in the world, uh, but um, it's uh, languages open doors, understanding helps you learn. Uh, there's nothing like 
travel to, to really help you, you see different perspectives. Uh, and we could, there's a lot we can, can learn from each other in addition to competing with each other um, as just well-spoken. Uh, it reminds me of an anecdote from um, Robert Louis Stevenson's story where the, uh, the hero is a young boy. He's, he's stuck in a ship with a, a pirate and they are enemies, but they, they need to bring the ship back to an, uh, uh, land. So they have to work together. And uh, in a way we are, are stuck on a ship here together and we need to uh, you know, find our way forward. And so this, you know, this should be something to bring us together. And you know, I hope that other people like my, like my daughter having experience can, can help prevent this attitude of thinking that we, we need to, to you know, fight for limited resources. It's, I agree, it's, it's, it's not the case. And if, if we understand each other, we can learn from each other. This is definitely a step forward. Yeah. Um, yeah, so basically then you also answered the second question as well, whether um, space missions are a good way to bring people together across the globe. So Yeah, um, I think we all would agree agree for that. I, the, the, the devil's in the details how we can, can maximize our, our uh, efficiency. Uh, we have trouble organizing, you know, econo economies and, and resources. It's sad, but it's it's not an easy thing to do, and, and you know, we have poor poor distribution of, of resources, uh, unfortunate inequalities, and if we can improve some of our systems, possibly using you know public currencies, improve some of our um, techno technological things, eliminate the some of the border issues. Uh, one thing I, I comment that my um, the head of the department at University of Bern, we. Uh, is trying to work with with China on a few a few missions, and uh, he's he's worked with every other space program uh, around the world. This is some of the the best uh, facilities for testing satellites there and and um, and instruments. And unfortunately, he hasn't had much success. So I hope that that can can uh, can change, and we can have more. Um, more openness. I know it's it's uh, sometimes working with NASA. It's quite difficult. There's f hurdles for foreigners to jump through to, to get into the certain rooms, and it's usually uh, annoying. But at least there, there are a large number of Chinese working in for NASA, and and uh, I think that maybe that's not the case. Maybe I should ask Gong Ling. Is is that are there some foreigners working in the Chinese space program? Uh, yes, and uh, for the they have two different ways for the working in the Chinese space program. One is uh, we like uh, more like international cooperation. It means the people working in a different place and they make the contribution, whatever hardware contribution or use uh, ground facilities. And and also that uh, we are slowly. And I have to say that uh, working, you know, the working environment in China is is uh, at this moment is still for the for the Chinese. Uh, people with the Chinese citizenship, but we are also open our uh, facilities and also the, like the space labs, for example, and for the for the visiting um, scientists. And uh, this year we also, I talked with uh, uh, um, my uh, uh, friends in China and to see, now I'm working in the International Space University. We also have, they also take the students from from our university. He's an Italian, and to do his internship in the in the Chinese uh, in institution for space development. And uh, so this is uh, we also try to open it uh, in a different level, and also for some others, like the training. And we also received the instructor from Europe and to do the training in China. And so the people, the instructor, could working together and. Uh, they can understand each other, cultural, language, and also, you know, the build a kind of personal relationship. This is also very important for the future. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, so now we already um, arrived at our last question. And actually, this question is to all of you. Um, I would like to have Dr. Zubrin to start with the answer. Um, yeah, but first I quickly read you the question. 
So from an engineering point of view, so if we leave away politics and all these things away, um, what would be the best way to build a permanent Mars base? Should the United States slash SpaceX build their own base and the Chinese build their own base on Mars and maybe other nations as well? Or again, would it make more sense if they would build together a base? Um, but if they would build separate bases, should there be at least some coordination? So, for example, that they would build their bases um, nearby from each other. So if there was an emergency at any of the bases that um, other bases could help them. Um, and also, um, so if there would be cooperation on Mars between the different nations, um, would it also make sense that, for example, then the Chinese astronauts could also speak English and perhaps the U.S. astronauts could also speak Chinese? So I'm giving the word to, to Robert. Okay. Well, actually, um, I think we'd probably have a more creative program if there were a number of different bases on Mars. Uh, there's certainly room on Mars for more than one flag. Uh, it um, is a planet with a surface area equal to all the continents of the Earth put together. Now, obviously, we should be prepared to help each other. Um, and uh, I believe there's even an agreement in place right now uh, for astronauts of different nations to help each other that was put in place by the U.S., and the Soviets years ago, and, and I would assume it, it, it has been signed on to by all spacefaring nations. If not, it should be. Uh, and this should clearly be, be the case on Mars. But I, I think aside from the difficulties of uh, directly sharing uh, the technologies of a uh, single base, given the realities of uh, Earth, uh, I simply think that it would be better if there were more creative contributions tried. If, you know, maybe Europeans will try to power their base with solar energy and they'll either show it can be done or it can't be done. And maybe the Americans will try one kind of nuclear reactor and the Chinese will try another. Um, the, 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 you know, the bases will be organized in different ways and, ways and, uh, and, and we could see which system works the best, uh, different uh, ground vehicle technologies will be tried. Uh, I, I just think that, um, uh, uh, you know, once again, sure, we should be there to render assistance and we should also have, uh, although I don't think there's too much problems with interference in the flight plans of each other, and there won't be that much flight traffic, but uh, let each nation show its talent. Uh, and um, Sure, smaller nations which can't have their own individual program should join in with one of the larger players. Uh, but, um, but certainly, uh, I, I do not agree that going to Mars is so expensive that it can only be done with a single program with all nations contributing. Uh, I, I think the United States can easily, if, it, if it's done right, support a Humans to Mars program. I think China can. I think Europe can. Um, uh, frankly, I think Russia can, and Japan can, and India can, mm -hmm. and yeah. the the you know. So uh, let uh, let a thousand flowers bloom. Yeah. Thank you very much, Robert. Um, Gongling, what is your uh, view? Uh, uh, thank you. And uh, this is a very interesting uh, question, and uh, for the engineering point of view, and uh, yeah. We have to think about you know the, the for the different phases and uh, from now on because we are still very early phase for the mass exploration and uh, to the if we think in today and also for the future the human station and on the mass is still quite a long gap a big gap there and so i i also i totally agree with the robot's idea and uh, for the technology development and we should uh, follow the olympics spirit it means that uh, 
people and use their the 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 talent and capacity and to working their own and to 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 explore the different uh, um, technical approach and also for the uh, flight itself and how to build the and you when we really thinking to build a, a mass space there we have to have some other technology which is ready and for either for the technology demonstration or for some installation and for the for the uh, mass station and uh, and of course and for we have to thinking for the international cooperation and especially in this area it, it not means that we build every we put uh, all our um, energy capacity and working together it means that when we have to put the the, the 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 consideration to help each other at the uh, at the very beginning and like i think the the south pool exploration could be a nice example and if then the the commercialization for the space exploration becomes uh, um reality also for the mass exploration and the, the, every country could build their own mass space and they can they can help each other and when especially in some difficulty phases and they can sharing their, their resources there yeah. and this is my thinking and so first then for technology demonstration and also in the end we could do it like a more like the what was the Olympic uh, uh, spirit and to do it our uh, different country to make their contribution themselves and for the f final human settlement on the Mars and people have to thinking to to working together at least they have a good coordination and uh, what they are living there and to really build uh, diverse, the communities with diversity and not a uh, uh, place which is uh, it's, uh, just one country or even one company. This is my thinking. Okay, thank you very much, Gongling. Uh, Lucas, what do you think about it? Well, uh, I guess I think a lot about the, the engineering aspect that um, is perhaps not as sexy as uh, aerospace and rockets, but that is the uh, soil science. Can we build a box that has sustainable life inside it? It will need to do for a human colony and and can we uh understand the chemistry of, of the soil enough to to perform engineering with that i see that as being one of our weak points and we need to address the weak points um i think uh other than uh you robert on uh, um only other person i can name who's done more thinking of, of on this as approaching years is um kim stanley robertson's i'd like to ask you if, if you uh share some of his vision of uh, Mars exploration or if, uh, if you differ in any points uh, with his Mars series of uh, red Mars, green Mars, blue Mars. <laughs> uh, what, what do you think, Robert? Is, does he capture well a, a, a realistic um, uh, timeline for Mars colonization with those books? Um so are, are you asking me when I think of Kim Stanley Robinson? Yeah, books? basically, yes. <laughs> well, uh, I, I enjoyed Red Mars. Um, I kind of lost the thread with the second book. But the um, in Red Mars, of course, there's this interesting debate over whether it is right to terraform Mars. Um, and... Uh, I think this is an interesting philosophical debate, uh, although I don't think that the Mars colonists will find it remotely debatable. They'll say, yes, we're going to terraform Mars uh, yeah. because uh, the uh, people will always, in fact, life will always try to improve its environment to make it more friendly for life. That is what life does. Um, the... Uh, the interesting thing there is, you know, in this question of environmental ethics, um, is it environmental ethics to keep Mars dead or is it environmental ethics to make it alive? And the clearly, if anyone proposed to make Earth dead, we would regard that as 
a criminal opinion uh, and a criminal program if, if they attempted to implement it. Um, so if making Earth like Mars is evil, then making Mars like Earth must be good. And the um, and so um, you know that's where I'm coming from, uh, and I, I found it interesting. Now you know oh, the Mars Society created a flag for Mars, uh, and it is red, green, and blue tricolor. Um, and uh, part of the inspiration was the Kim Stanley Robinson series, although part was also simply uh, the reasons why those are the colors in the Kim Stanley Robinson series, which is the red Mars that is today the green life that will transform it and the fully living blue planet that it could become. So that is what is symbolized in the Martian flag. And uh, you may find pictures of it in various places on the internet. It's a tricolor. It looks somewhat like the French flag, except it's red, green, and blue. Okay. And, uh, yes, Gongli. <laughs> and for me, I also want to put uh, one point here and for the also for the people's consideration, maybe for the audience in the future. And for the engineering point of view, I think it is also one, and because at this moment, we're thinking about uh, the mass uh, station. And indeed, I think for the future mass uh, immigration, the most important things, and uh, we need the disrupt technology for the propulsion system. Because at this moment, fly to the Mars, it takes too long time, several months. You know, if we need the, the disrupt technology and which is really moving fast and to short the flight schedule. And this is also very important. And, uh, and I hope that the, the space community could think about this one and find a revolutionary way for the propulsion system and to make it shorter. And if we always, you know, the limited by the, this several years period for the flight, and then it's difficult for us. And especially if we want to make it more efficiently, it will make us kind of thinking to say for the immigration to the Mars and with the in certain period and with the current technology it's uh, i i'm not very optimistic for this uh, the i mean for the development time and after we have the disruptive technology for propulsion for example we fly there only need two weeks or three weeks and then it could be easier the current propulsion system still there is still a big gap and for the real commercialization or for the colonization to the Mars. What, what is your um, response, Robert, um, to what Gongling said? Well, propulsions, uh, obviously improved propulsion is always welcome, but we can get to Mars right now in six months um, that many of our Mars probes have actually gone to Mars on six month trajectories. That is how long it took Spirit and Opportunity to travel to Mars. That is how long it took Insight to travel to Mars, um, or Mars Express. Uh, and six months, okay, it's a long trip, but it is the standard duration of a stay on the space station. Uh, it is how long it took to sail from England to Australia in the 1800s. Uh, it's certainly a voyage that people can do. Um, so, um, you know, if I had a superior propulsion system, such as, for instance, nuclear thermal propulsion, which has got twice the exhaust velocity of chemical propulsion, um, I would actually use it to increase the payload uh, rather than try to decrease the trip time. Uh, because uh, increasing the payload for a given launch mass um, increases the economics and it also increases the safety. It means that you can have your life support system more uh, 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 redundantly backed up and, and so forth. In other words, if you're operating within a given budget, which means a given launch capability, um, how do you spend that? And if I had better propulsion, I'd use it to increase the payload. I think a six month transit to Mars is acceptable. Great, yeah. 
So I think with that, um, I would like to close this session. Um, again, I would like to thank every one of you. It was, in my opinion, it was a very interesting, very enlightening conversation that we had today. Um, I'm in Switzerland, so it has to be on a neutral basis. So there wasn't much politics mm -hmm. involved today. Um, yeah, so it was very interesting. Thank you very much. I would also like to um, quickly make a little advertisement for the case for space, which is uh, Dr. Zubrin's uh, latest book. Um, I can warmly recommend anyone to read it. Um, has, has it already been translated to Chinese? Yeah, I saw the from the there. This is uh, I can read it in Chinese. You know that that one nearby. That one in Chinese version. Maybe you also should hear the Chinese version. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah Besides, this is the I can. Let me close the look, and it's uh, like a flight to the Mars in Chinese. Oh, the other book is yeah. case for Mars, and uh, this is actually uh. the. Taiwan. Oh, you uh, the Mars uh, in mainland. China. Oh, uh, yes. immigration to Mars. Oh, super yeah. great. <laughs> great, great. Okay, I think we have we have a plan. Four people have already signed up, right? <laughs> so let's go together, right? Okay. <laughs> and meet there together at least, right? Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, again, thank you very okay. much and um, have thank a you. great day.